Indy 500 Films presents The Legends of the Brickyard. Hi everyone, I'm Bob Jenkins. Welcome to another in our series, The Legends of the Brickyard. Indianapolis and auto racing can mean only one thing, the continuing quest for speed. In the last seven years, the 200-mile-an-hour barrier had been shattered with a vengeance, and 1988 was no exception. But only half of the battle is speed, the other is survival, and certainly no man has weathered the famed brickyard better than Roger Penske. In the last five years, he made the triumphant trip to victory lane four times. This year, he stood ready to unleash a powerful trio while already owning a combined seven Indianapolis 500 crowns. Would Penske's men of steel, Al Unser Sr., Rick Mears, and Danny Sullivan be able to pull off a 1-2-3 finish, a feat never before accomplished? Well, only time will tell. The sounds, the smells, the sights, just all of it together. You just can't describe it. You, you can't get the full picture across on television either. It's something you really have to come and see one time. It's, it's just absolutely a happening. Welcome to Indianapolis, Indiana, a city like many others in America, except for the 31 days that make up the month of May. While other cities welcome the return of daffodils and robins each May, Indianapolis adds its own rite of spring, the Indianapolis 500. For anyone who has heard the thunder of a race engine or marveled at the graceful lines of an Indy car, there is only one place to be. The Indianapolis 500 is a tradition that gives this city a quintessential quality, one that hundreds of thousands come to experience. For those who feel the racing beat in their hearts, there is only one place to be in May, Indianapolis, Indiana. Practice began in search of the speed necessary for a starting field, but as always, the course exacted a heavy toll for the smallest of mistakes. tremendous place you know it's uh, the old awesome term i guess is uh, it's just so big uh, so many people such tradition um, just a tremendous place as the countdown to qualification days begin practice becomes a vital search for speed by a team and its drivers but this year the testing between drivers began even before the race itself Rick Mears, in Roger Penske's PC-17 Chevrolet, was doing some high-speed toying with Mario Andretti. While Mears challenged his opposition, the Andretti team had an answer each time for their challenger. When the practice session flag finally fell, it was Andretti who had blasted to a new unofficial track record. Appropriately, Indy's fastest driver draws first position for qualifications. But Andretti's not happy with his run. At 214.692 miles per hour, Mario was far from his earlier practice speed. Al Unser, the defending Indianapolis 500 winner, guides his Penske Chevrolet to a 215.270 mile an hour mark, good enough for the front row. Danny Sullivan places his Chevrolet-powered Penske machine in the front row with a 216.214 mile-an-hour clocking and sets a single-lap record while doing so. Mears moves out. The pressure is on to make it an all-Penske front row. And Mears blisters his own official track record with the fastest official one lap at Indy, 220.453 miles an hour, with an overall average of 219.198 miles an hour. Mears joins A.J. Foyt and Rex Mays as Indy's only four-time pole winner. And with teammates occupying the entire front row, it's a Penske sweep. They'll pace the rest of the field that's made up of Mario Andretti, Al Unser Jr., Ari Leyendijk, Scott Brayton, Emerson Fittipaldi, 
Derek Daly, Michael Andretti, Randy Lewis, Roberto Guerrero, Kevin Kogan, Tom Sneva, Bill Kruger, Dick Simon, Teo Fabi in the Porsche Indy debut, Jim Crawford, Bobby Rahal, Raul Boisel, Dominic Dobson, A.J. Boyd, Billy Bukovic III, Tony Bettenhausen, Carol Palmrock, Steve Chassie, John Andretti, Rocky Moran, Stan Fox, Johnny Rutherford, Ludwig Heimrath Jr., Rich Vogler, Howdy Holmes. It's the first time in the history of the Indy 500 that one car owner has placed three cars in the front row. While Penske was making history by sweeping the front row, a rookie by the name of Billy Vukovic III was also making an unprecedented start. He became the first third-generation driver to start in the Indianapolis 500, following in the footsteps of his father and his grandfather, who was a two-time winner. Vukovic, one of five rookies to make the starting field in 1988. As race day dawns, every driver awakes with a feeling down deep that he's felt before, but yet a feeling that is unlike any of these other 30 days in May. Some will pass the feeling off as butterflies in the stomach. More aptly described, the sensation is one of intense anticipation. A year of preparation, in fact, a lifetime of dreaming and planning is now about to be compressed into one three-hour time period. Like a high-powered telescope, time is now coming into focus. That focus is on 33 men anxiously awaiting their chance to run with the best. Each deals with his anticipation in a different way. Following routine, breaking routine, one by one they arrive. A.J. Hoyt, Al Unser Jr., 85 winner Danny Sullivan. Two-time winner Rick Mears. With more than 300,000 in attendance and millions more tuned in via ABC television and the Indianapolis Motor Speedway radio network, there are still only 33 men today who know what one lap at Indy will be like. Only a lap at Indy when you're running very very strong it's a it's a long two and a half miles you've got a long long front straightaway and it's uh it's almost looking down like looking down a tunnel or a hallway and it just seems to kind of disappear going into turn one especially when you have 400,000 people surrounding the track it's the old saying of basically threading the needle into turn one that's exactly what you're doing and to be able to do it at 200 mile an hour that's covering you know 300 feet per second you come off of turn one you've scrubbed off a little bit of speed in turn one so it makes turn two a little bit easier and you run basically through there wide open uh, you run the same similar line in turn two as you do one as far as the apexes go, but it's a little bit more comfortable corner. Then you got the long back straightaway again, which makes turn three another difficult corner and looking down a hallway. It's not quite as bad as turn front straightaway because of the grandstands. There aren't any on the back. And you enter turn three, again, threading the needle. Very fine. And again, you scrub off a little bit of speed, which gives you get a run through the short shoot between three and four. And in turn four is you know, basically a little bit more comfortable corner, depending on which way the wind's blowing. And then you're earning the long front straightaway again. They're all aware of the danger. What each anticipates even more is the thrill of driving with the best. Only 33 drivers get this chance each year. And all 33 know they're about to have the ride of their lives.
from the thrill of being in the field. Each driver has the same goal. But what does it take to win at Indy? It's, this is definitely a team effort to win this race. There's no one person that gets the job done. It takes everybody pulling together very hard. And uh, all things going right at the right time, right place to be able to win this race. And uh, I've just got to say that the Penske team is the best in the business. real crowded you know i think the first lap or two is just a matter of survival more than anything else paced by the oldsmobile cutlass supreme pace car and with heat waves on the track dancing like an elusive victory mirage in front of them the field makes its final approach and the 1988 indianapolis 500 is underway and also stops against the outside wall. The yellow caution flag reigns in the field. The GMC safety trucks arrive. All drivers are out of their cars safely. And once again, Indy bears its power, reasserting to another Indy field just how delicately these first laps must be handled. Start. The field reshapes into a familiar pattern. Sullivan, Mears, Al Unser, who's hotly followed by his son, Al Unser Jr. Roger Penske looks on. It's Stan Fox who's into the pits first with the first mechanical headache of the day. Meanwhile, it's still Sullivan and Mears blistering the field and the track. Stan Fox wheels his ailing car to the garage, this year's first dropout. One of the most heartwarming stories in 88 was that of Roberto Guerrero. A testing accident here at the Speedway the previous fall had left the popular Colombian unconscious for more than two weeks. Miraculously, Guerrero returned to the starting field this year in a bid to become only the second man to record a top four finish in his first five starts. However, that first lap crash prevented him from tying Harry Hart's record established back in the 20s. It also marked the first time Guerrero did not receive the checkered flag at Indy. In his previous four starts, he completed 798 out of a possible 800 laps. Paul Sitter Mears is into the pits. He had been dropping back steadily with handling problems. As his crew works, Mears continues to lose precious time. begin on lap 29. Front runner Danny Sullivan finds he can't shake an old nemesis, Mario Andretti. Speed in the pits is every bit as critical as speed on the track. The first to leave the pit will be the leader of the pack. There goes Sullivan. Andretti is falling behind. With every second, Andretti is losing the length of a football field. Back on the track, Sullivan is again the focus as he threads in and out of traffic. Tail Bobby finds a rear wheel is not bolted down, prematurely ending Porsche's first effort at Indy. It's Andretti into the pits with a possible transmission seal problem. 
Meanwhile, Sullivan continues to batter the rest of the field. The 1985 Indy 500 winner got his first IndyCar start in 1982 at Atlanta. After a tour of Formula One in 83, Danny rejoined the Indy ranks. Tom Sneva, making his 14th Indy start, loses control early and spins down the pit road. The Sneva misfortune allows Harry Leyendijk to move up to second position and a chance to catch Sullivan. The action up front can't detract from a fierce battle where Al Unser and Al Jr. vie for third position. And they're all in the pursuit of this man, Danny Sullivan. Al Jr. dives deep inside the line, trying to overtake his father, but just can't do it. It's Boyd into the turn two wall. His record 31st start in Indy comes to an abrupt end on lap 55. Sullivan takes this opportunity to pit. There, he joins Andretti, who has been pit side since the previous stop. On the restart, Ludwig Heimrath into the wall. He got tagged as the field was coming up to speed for the restart. The incident builds into major mayhem as leader Sullivan just barely skates by. The mishap also brings in second place runner Leyendijk, who sustained front wing damage. With the field sorted out, it's still Sullivan in the lead. Behind him, the Unser battle again rages, with Al Unser Jr. slipping under his father to move up a position. As the race winds on, the laps begin to take their toll. Sullivan is in for a front wing alignment. Al Unser Jr. is sidelined with a bad CV joint. Al Unser is also in the pit with handling problems. All of this unscheduled action allows Rick Mears, who earlier suffered handling problems, to get by Sullivan, who unlap himself on lap 91. Steve Chassis loses it. Careening and spinning to a halt. Chassis is okay. Meanwhile, Jim Crawford, making the strongest run to date at Indy with a Buick, moves to the lead at mid-race. Suddenly, it's Sullivan into the wall. Roger Penske watches as his three chances for victory diminish by one-third. Crawford moves into the pits as Al Unser inherits the lead. This allows Unser to break the record held by Ralph De Palma since 1921 for the most laps led at Indy. Now at 625 total laps. Down the long backstretch, Rick Mears passes Al Unser for the lead. It's now Mears, Unser, Crawford, two Chevrolets and a Buick. Just as remarkable in 1988 was the comeback story of Jim Crawford. A strong front row contender in 87, the Scotsman suffered a devastating crash while attempting to qualify, which severely injured both feet. It was more than six months before he was able to take his first steps again. Though Crawford still needed crutches to get around during the month of May, his handicap was not evident once the green flag fell. With all the yellow flags, with all the distractions, what does it do to a driver's concentration? A lot of time with the yellows, if you're you know, having to dial the car and work with the car to try to get the car the way you want it, a lot of times the yellows help you. It brings you in in a shorter amount of time, and you can, you know, you can make ch more changes on the car. Mears and Unser come screaming down the pit road together. In a synchronized ballet of action, the Penske crews become mirror images as once again the race for the lead is in the pits. the pressure is immense. His two cars fighting for the lead and both locked in a wheel-to-wheel -wheel duel as the final chapter begins to unfold. Johnny Rutherford slams the turn two wall. The three-time Indy winner becomes yet another casualty of this race of records.
Unser is back in the pits as he waits for service. Emerson Fittipaldi moves into second. Fittipaldi, who's quietly been moving up through the field all day, attracts some notice. The former Formula One world champion is making an impressive bid to conquer yet another renowned racing venue. As the race winds down, Mears continues to lead, recording the fastest lap ever recorded in competition at Indy, 209.517 miles an hour. But as the laps dwindle, the pressure mounts. With so much on the line at Indy, with so little distance to go, the 500 can play mind games with even the most experienced of drivers. He grips the steering wheel a little tighter, hears every turn of the engine, begins to feel every vibration. Pretty the last 10 laps, if you're leading her 20 even. It's, uh, you know, you start hearing all kinds of different noises and, uh, you know, thinking you may have a problem here, you may have a problem there, and, and that, try, that tends to pull your concentration away, which you have to keep focused on exactly what you're doing because that's the time you can't make a mistake. Rick Mears, so smooth, so in control. On a day of havoc at Indy, Mears has filtered through it all. Much like his own career, Mears has overcome setbacks on this day to regain the dominant position he's held all month at the Brickyard. The yellow caution flies a record 14th time. Michael Andretti's side pod lies in wait of rescue on the track with just three laps to go. As the Penske crew looks on, the end is now clear. The 1988 Indy 500 will finish under yellow with Rick Mears at the helm. A happy Penske crew celebrates as Mears makes his way to victory lane to join the party. It's the first time that the Indy race has finished under yellow for reasons other than weather since 1967. For the third time in the past 10 years, Rick Mears visits the most cherished piece of racing real estate, Victory Lane. It's a record seventh visit for car owner Roger Penske. The win also marks a triumph for the Chevrolet engine, the first time since 1977 that the Indy 500 has not been won by a Cosworth. A beaten and exhausted Emerson Fittipaldi climbs from his car, comforted in the thought that he's conquered second place at Indy. The largest Indy payout ever leaves Mears with a record $809,853 from a purse of over $5 million and a clean sweep for the Penske team. Rick Mears, a three-time Indy winner, the champion of the 72nd running of the Indianapolis 500. Rick Mears needed only 10 years in which to claim his third Indy 500, joining three other drivers and accomplishing that feat in the 80s alone. Owner Roger Penske might have pulled off history had Danny Sullivan not crashed, and had his third car, piloted by Unzer, finished second instead of third, it would have marked the fourth time teammates had finished first and second. Maury Rose and Bill Holland drove the Blue Crown Specials to 1-2 finishes in 1947, repeating the accomplishment the following year, and only leader car teammates Roger Ward and Len Sutton have duplicated that feat since in 1962. A late pit stop cost Crawford a chance for victory. However, he still managed to bring his Buick home for a very respectable sixth place finish. And how about the Cinderella story of Phil Kruger? The veteran mechanic wheeled his three-year-old March to eighth, completing 196 laps. Also, Billy Vukovic III became the second driver in this decade to follow in his father's footsteps by winning Rookie of the Year honors. The other was Michael Andretti. Vuki wound up 14th. And that concludes our look at the 1988 Indianapolis 500. I'm Bob Jenkins. Join us again for Legends of the Brickyard.